are very different. They, they've been holding their feces for long periods of time. Their metabolism has been remarkably slow. Springtime, they have to ramp up and become essentially a completely different creature and fast. Um, sugars can cause uh, diarrhea. So when they're having a rough time already coming out of the winter, the last thing you want them to have is a problem with the food that they're getting. So we don't feed sugar. Just don't. And the only time that we as a group will say feed sugar is if you make it a supplement and you look online and find that you basically make it with, with a base of nettle tea and there are things you can add to it and you only feed it if your bees are about to starve. Otherwise, save your honey stores, no other beekeepers that have good healthy hives and you know, borrow honey, but we just don't go the sugar out because it seems to really make more problems for them than it fixes. Yeah, I think it's called divert sugar. It's a certain type of sugar, but no, we don't do any sugary things. Did you say that we set out a bowl of honey? Yes. And you watch that bowl. You obviously honey from the bowl. Yes. So you could judge. there's any time when I'm seeing that bowl being like mobbed, and you know how it can look when they go like in a frenzy and they're all over it, you come over there and they're nasty and they're trying to sting you and they're going crazy, then I know somebody here doesn't have any food at all and I'll go look at my hives but if what I'm seeing, even on a rainy day, is a few bees are at the bowl you know, then I know everybody's pretty well fine and I've been checking with some of my um, students and saying, how are they doing? Are they really going after the honey or not? And they like, no, they're not touching it. Okay, then you're fine. So that's just kind of, and I don't do that in autumn because they would mob it and it would be a robbing situation. But in spring, in my own yard with my hives, this is a method that I've tried that seems to work. Um, let's go around the... 
circle here and ask who has any questions right now about their hives or what they're doing or how their bees are looking. Ginger? Uh, yeah, and remind me, just poke me if I don't, poke me. Okay. okay, do you have a question? Okay, who has some concerns about their bees or bees that are about to come or hives that you're making? God, I can just go home, you guys know it all. How many have bees? How many have bees now? Okay, so looking for swarms. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, the question was about um, I'm tending an observation hive in Washougal and the queen died. And so we were talking for a long time about can we even get a queen to replace them at this time of year because, you know, they lost her, what was it, Pixie, almost a month ago or something? Yeah. And I just kept my eye on the hive and um, and we had a, have, a, have an opportunity now to get a new queen and I'll be picking her up. Uh, tomorrow, and then we'll install her like at seven in the morning on Sunday. So what Jennifer and I did in preparation for that was we went over and for the first time since it's been put up, we took the observation hive down. It's a big observation hive. It's like like three by four or something, four and a half. So it's um, eight full frames, two by two, two. Two, two, two. So in the inside, you can't see what's going on. You can mostly see when they're all on the outside, but I really had no idea what was happening between the frames. How many bees were really left? Was there a queen hiding in there somewhere who just still wasn't into laying? Like what was going on? So Jennifer and I took the hive apart and uh, pulled out the frames, and they were plastic frames. And I haven't been up for those since we put them in, but that's the way we had to set the hive up. So we pulled out the plastic frames and Jennifer ripped them apart and we just hung back empties. And then there's two frames that they've made their own wax on and we moved that up. So there was nothing going on on the inside, nothing being laid, no laying workers, no worker bees had decided to take the role of the queen yet. So they were, and they were just kind of milling around like bees do when they don't have a queen. But there were lots of bees. So I feel really good of about that. So what we had to do was take them out of the two frames on the four sides that they were on and get them to crawl back up into the observation hive. And so I lit an old Meerschaum pipe and got on the ground and, and uh, actually it's online right now. I, I posted the pictures this morning on preservation beekeeping site and there's me with my face in a, in a frame of bees blowing a Meerschaum pipe. <laughs> you have to get them to kind of walk up. And that got them moving, but it didn't get them moving fast enough. And so we kind of, um, both of us sat there and we feathered and blew smoke and feathered and blew smoke. And they all went back up in and balled up along the top where they should. And so it was successful and they're back up there and they've got a chance. They'll either take the new queen or they won't. So yeah, thanks for asking. We actually did it. So. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Ginger. Okay. Um, Ginger's question is, um, her bees are pulling out larvae and dumping them. Now, basically, when I speak, I will tell you whether it's something I've read and I kind of trust or whether it's something that I've experienced. So what I've experienced in the springs um, and I don't know if this is true for other treatment-free folks or not, but in the spring, once the buildup starts, that's the time that I am most likely to see larva tossed out. Sometimes it's old dead larva that got cold, right? So they're flinging it out because it's no good. And they finally have enough bees to do housekeeping, right? In the winter, it's like nobody's doing housekeeping, but now they really are. So there's a lot of old stuff that they're pulling out and cleaning up because there's enough bees. And also, the drones right now, they're flinging out drone larvae because the drones are where the varroa is most likely to lay. So they'll go into those cells. And I'm seeing drones in a few of my colonies that are not flying yet. They'll come out and they're too weakened. 
by, you know, probably the varroa count in the hive. So it'll be a while before there's enough to kind of build the numbers up. In. And some of the hives are flying. But I noticed that. I, I noticed um, in all four of my hives, I've seen tossed out deformed wing virus. So two of my hives are three years old, and two of my hives are last year's swarms. So they're all exhibiting. So I know that there's varroa in all those hives. We all know that. And But now I'm going to watch them and see if in the skeps how they manage that. I've already got one um, hive that might swarm like now. She's bearding the whole face of the, you know, she's ready to go. And with those small skeps, they should be popping out swarms like that. And then I'll see what happens with the larva tossing. But in my experience, that seems to get taken care of within a matter of a month or so. And that's what I've seen. So um, that's what you're dealing with. Yeah. How do the bees look when they bring up out of the cell and they're dead? How do the little, with the little bees, I've, I've never seen a dead varroa on any of them. And, oh, their question is, what do they look like when those, when those larvae are tossed? That, um, so a lot of them, there's never a varroa on them. A lot of them are discolored and shriveled, but what I notice is the deformed wings. It, it looks like somebody um, like lit a match to cellophane, and it kind of like crumples up. That's what their little wings look like. So that's how I know that's what it is. And basically, the problem with varroa mites is, okay, the mites weaken the bees by sucking the hemolyph, but the real danger is the varroa are becoming vectors for more and more serious bee viruses because we've made varroa so strong by treating them that now those varroa, those super varroa, are a perfect host for all kinds of viruses. You know, how to have somewhere to go. There's all kinds that they pass on, but the most obvious one to see is that deformed wing crumpling. So if you see some of that, don't freak out. And the other side is, that the good news of that aspect is if you have bees that are tossing them out, then you know that your bees know what they're doing and they're cleaning house and they've got some good hygienic behavior going on. So it's like if they weren't tossing them, honey, you know that they're in there. I mean, they're in there. They're in every hive. So when you get the girls flinging, you know, yay, yay bees. They're doing what they should. Uh, is there anything we can do for the viruses? No. Uh, in terms of like, you know, anything pharmaceutical, no. But our whole treatment method is what we do for the viruses. We try to really keep the bees strong. And so that is we don't feed them sugar. We don't jump in in the spring and bug them while they're trying to get their whole new, you know, setup going and the new baby's born. We try to make their lives as stress-free as possible. If they have good forage, if they have a stress-free, tidy house that they can easily defend, the hives are small, so they don't need a lot of stores to keep themselves together, and they can take care of every aspect of the hive that strengthens their immune system and their ability to fight the varroa. So, yes, our treatment is the way that we manage our bees. Yes? So if we don't see them tossing, is that problematic? Is that no. A problem? no. No. Don't, don't make problems or there aren't problems. Sometimes what they'll do, certain hives will uh, eat them. They'll pull the larva and they'll eat them because it's, you know, they, they just will. So, yeah. Any more questions? Uh, I'd like to add to what works for the health of the bees. Uh, what we call weeds, what you call weeds, excuse me, uh, is medicine. So that stress coming out of the garden, lines that you're mowing down, those are what the bees use to contain their way of treating themselves with herbs. Uh, back in the beginning, when the vir varroa mites started coming here in huge numbers and wiping out our apiaries, a lot of the apiaries noticed that the hives that were set in the middle of mint growing crazy, that hive didn't get it. So it's my contention that the bee knows what they need for their own viruses and their own diseases, 
And the more that we let things flower around us that maybe you don't appreciate, the better chance they have of getting their medicine to fight it themselves, which they've been doing for over 100 million years. Back on to what Pixie said about the plants that bees need. We all know, any of us who've ever had a chicken or any domestic creature, that domestic and wild are two different worlds. And it's the same for plants, too. Domestic plants are weakened. A cherry tomato, which was kind of the original tomato, has as much nutrition in it as a beefsteak. It, the nutrition doesn't expand with the size of the, of the fruit. And I, I've always found that really, really fascinating. So the, so the weeds um, are very strong because they've not been cultivated. And their strength and their ability to thrive shows how strong that they are. I mean, you know, you probably all had flowers. You've had to baby like heck. And you're going, why do I even bother? Well, the weeds grow. And they grow because they're incredibly strong. And they're incredibly in tune to place and with the mineral kingdom. So as many weeds as you can leave, you know, leave them. I mean, my yard is a big mishmash of plantings and weeds. And, um, and every year, I see more and more and more native pollinators. So it makes a difference. Yes. About um, mushrooms in the rainforest, and I live in Port Angeles, and that's one of the reasons I want to explore that because they found <clears throat> they did research from Eastern University in, in the East Coast, mm -hmm. and they found that the bees were drinking this mushroom virus, uh, mushroom juice, and it was keeping the mites away. They. Mm -hmm. So has anything developed from that? Because that was yeah. a few years Paul's ago. Paul's is now in the testing end, and he is testing out a solution of, Paul Stamets is like a mushroom guru guy. He knows everything about mushrooms. He's created mushrooms that will eat oil, that can clean up oil spills. He's created mushrooms that he sent over to Fukushima. They're eating up all the radiation. I mean, it's amazing what mushrooms can do. Mushrooms are actually more closely related to human beings than other animals are. It's like we have a lot of receptors in our body for the goodness of mycelium. The things, the diseases that bother us are bacteria and things that mushrooms don't like. So they've come up with a chemical means of fighting them. So Paul Stamets, what he originally found was uh, one of his mushroom patches outside, he noticed for days was covered with bees. And he never really thought about it before. And he started to look into that and realized that they were landing on it in the mornings after the mushrooms had kind of seeped overnight. And they were click, 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 click. So he started putting together what, what he knew to be extremely strong healing mushrooms. And he came up with a patented brew that's now being tested out kind of all over Washington. And they think within a couple of years that it will be available. And I think the way it will be available is to put it in solution and the bees can drink it if they want. So it's there. So I'm real excited about that. And um, and one of the reasons why I love the echo floors in my hive, all of my hives sit on a box that is devoted to mulch on the bottom, and it's got a door in the side so I can feed through the door. But that mulch in the bottom is just mulch that I get out of my yard. Uh, it's old like tree trimming mulch. So there's white mushroom mycelium running through all of it. And I put that into the bottom in that, in that dedicated bottom box. And I spray it with water every now and then when it gets really dried out. But then when the bees really kick in and they have a lot of humidity going, that helps it keep damp. And that becomes a place where mycelium can grow. And I've also noticed I have two log hives. And before I put bees in them, I noticed in the winter when the hive was just setting, the whole inside grew mushrooms. So I know that there's mycelium all through that old wood. And we have no idea kind of what it does yet. But the more we learn about mushrooms and mycelium, the more we realize, hey, this is a plant ally or a creature ally that we have, we have not utilized nearly as well as we should. So good, yes, mushrooms are coming and, and I'm on it. When it comes out, I'm going to know. <laughs> the, 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 
if you all haven't heard about it yet, it, it's trying to simulate what's at the bottom of a rotted out tree. Well, part of what we're exploring is what, what structures do bees prefer to go in when they, when they make the decision, which is rotted out trees and walls of our houses because they're insulated. I mean, that, that part, but just the tree part, going back to more the basic, um, is, is, is that stuff, that, that fabulous stuff inside a rotted out oak tree. Yeah, and I have tons of creatures living in. The wax moths live down there, and I have ant colonies that live in all of them. Um, and I have earwigs and pill bugs and, and springtails and spiders, because when spiders hatch out, you know, the little babies are so tiny. Think of what they could do to mites. Holy cow, go spiders, go. So um, so all kinds of creatures live there, and, and I just watch them and enjoy it. Usually in the spring, I'll throw another handful you know, of, of fresh mulch in. And if there's dead bees in the bottom, which there always are after winter, you just leave them, they become compost, just toss in some more mulch on top and whatever's down there will eat them and it'll be good stuff. Um, so what I have noticed, uh, who here has heard me talk about echo floors? Okay, I, I have a caveat about echo floors this morning. Um, I've always said, keep the whole thing wide open. Right, just put, you know, here's the echo floor, you put your hive on top of it. And if you have a skip, you, which I do, you've got the board and a big hole cut out and the hive goes on top. So, what I discovered <laughs> yesterday is that, uh, is that my bees were so excited with their skip and they grew out so big that they built right straight down. And I've got a photo on my phone of when I opened the little echo floor door honeycomb fat boom, 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 all the way down. So what I'm going to recommend is uh, put, put some screening, but big enough screening so that everything can drop through and then cut a little hole so the bees can get down there and access food when you put it down there. But that will act as a partial floor that should discourage them from just going. And I, I don't mind that this hive did that. It's like, cool, you know, you took up the extra space and someday when they perish, then I'll clean that all out. But now I don't ha have an easy way to feed because, you know, that was down there. But I don't feed that much anyhow, so it's not too much a problem. When I see these trees in the wild inside of trees, what you often see is there, you know, let's say this much of it has the comb coming down. And then there'll be a big gap in they call that the fall away. <laughs> so from the bottom of the comb, everything falls off into this big empty chamber. And then you've got the echo floor down below. So the ones in the wild actually have a good bit of difference, the distance in there. And I've had that same thing happen where they just went, no, we need more space. <laughs> we prioritize it right over the echo floor. Yeah, they did. They're like, more room and you ain't giving it to us, so we're going to take it. We're taking it over. Um, OK. Moving along, I'm going to turn things over to Thea, who has updates of many good things. So, Thea, take it away. <laughs> First thing, I don't want to forget to do this. So I just wanted to let people know that um, we have um, meetings every month, first Saturday of the month, and some people repeatedly come back, some people just come once. Um, there are opportunities for people to help um, organize what's going to be uh, the topic for the meeting, um, whether we have special speakers to come for the meeting, um, if we're going to have an activity like building um, whatever it is that we want for our bee yard. Uh, could be about plants, could be lots of different things. And I think there's a lot of people that um, don't like speaking in front of other people, but then there's other people that have experience doing that and feel comfortable with it. And even if you don't like speaking yourself, you could get other people to do this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass around uh, a copy of an agenda, which is um, what I came up with for the typical VCO meeting that we have. And we would like people to sign up to run a meeting. Now, some people don't want to run anything, and some people really like doing it, and some people would do it if they had a partner doing it. So it doesn't have to be you alone. 
but we really would like multiple people to get involved in uh, doing these meetings. So there might be particular things, uh, topics that are important for a particular time of year. So um, Jacqueline has her own workshop um, tomorrow on swarming. This is the time of year you want to talk to people about swarming. But there's other times of year, uh, years, for example, uh, at the end of the summer, bees run out of food, and most of the blooming that occurs for bees happens in the spring and the early summer, and then late summer and fall, the forage is not as readily available for bees. So maybe somebody could talk about that in the fall. Uh, maybe there's an expert. Uh, maybe Susan wants to talk, but she doesn't want to run the meeting. So what we're going to do is pass this paper around. Um, I'm going to send it around so you can um, sign up and put some information about con being contacted so that we can um, get this organized. Yeah, I, I just am tired of being, you know, me and Jacqueline being the mouths. And we're happy to do that because we'd love to talk about these. But we know that the way that you learn is also from listening to other people's stories. So some of you who have these, if you can even just get up and say, you know, I'm gonna tell you my bee story, how I came to bees, um, uh, the stuff that's worked for me, goofy things that I didn't expect, and, you know, bring pictures of your bee yard and stuff, because we all learn from sharing other people's experiences. And especially, you know, we teach, Bees are like sourdough. They're, every hive is different. It's its own living entity. And so you may have ways of keeping your bees that are novel and wonderful. And I could think, oh, I, I wonder if I could apply some of that to my bee yard. And also it makes a community where it's not like you're just coming here for a lecture. It's, it, it's building community. It's building a hive. You know, it's building the high where everybody participates. And we really want to see that happen. So I encourage you, you know, put some topics down, put yourself down. I would love to see this go where different people are running it every month. It would be really cool. Okay, so that is the first thing. I just wanted to make sure we knew about that. Um, some updates on some of the activities that we're doing. Um, we have a couple of fundraisers, and also we're going to be um, tabling uh, in the chemist days and the farmer's market here, and Debbie's going to talk to you about that, um, but we need volunteers. So people that like to table, uh, people that um, might be interested in, you know, talking to people about what we do as a group and what we're trying to encourage. Uh, so we need volunteers for that. So that is something that we need to have a sign up and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, Barry has been building high boxes and we have this fundraiser uh, campaign. That's the, the website fundraiser. So people are purchasing B boxes that Barry is building and then we're going to get volunteers, another place where we need volunteers, to um, sign up to assist with that. So there's putting up the boxes and then monitoring the boxes. The boxes are going to go on private and public property. For example, we're putting up a box outside this building. So the a library, campus library folks and the city of campus have agreed that it's a great idea to have a big box here, not where people can touch it. It's going to be up in a tree to be strapped up there and have some signage. So public property, individual people's property, uh, corporations, wherever. So we're encouraging people to get those boxes so that bees will have a home, a safe place to build and to swarm out of. And um, that particular activity requires both purchases for materials and the boxes themselves and also volunteers. So we need to have people who are interested in helping with that. We also are going to monitor those boxes during the growing season. So not only do the boxes have to go up, but they also have to um, be checked to make sure that the bees are okay, that there aren't some problems with the boxes. We have um, 
endoscopic cameras that are going to go into the bottom of the box. So, and we're going to post this online. If you purchase a box, it's going to have your name wood burned onto the outside of it. Plus, it also has a moniker. It has its own name. The um, the uh, each box has its name, and then that will be online. So you'll be able to see, even if you don't go visit the box and it's not at your house, you can actually see what's going on inside. So the swarms that we collect, and people are going to be um, really involved in that, and other people will be talking about the swarming. Um, those swarms will be put in those boxes that have been put before, and then um, there will be the Bees will eventually swarm out of those and possibly move into some of the other boxes that are put around them. So there's a whole bunch of different volunteer opportunities for people in this room and anybody else that you know that's interested. Yeah. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so <laughs> just please, please sign up to monitor bees. If you're learning about beekeeping, this is the best way to learn. It's not so much about going into the hive and looking and bothering bees. It's about watching the behavior and activity outside the hive. And this is the best, one of the best ways to learn. You gotta do. So, so we have, as you can see, a number of opportunities for people to volunteer. And something might strike you. Um, maybe you wanna do it once. Maybe you want to be on a team of people that does it multiple times. Everybody's got different needs for volunteering, and um, some people don't like volunteering at all, but would rather give, give money. I mean, that's everybody does this differently, but um, we're encouraging you to do this because that's how you're going to learn about beekeeping. That's how you're going to learn about bee behavior. Plus, you'll get to meet people in the group, and um, you'll educate yourself so you can educate other people, which is what this group is really about. Great. Thank you, ma'am. And it's fun. And it's fun. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to let Debbie Cochran talk about the events and fairs that we're going to be going to a bit. And then Jacqueline's going to talk about bait hives and swarming. And I brought my computer and I'll plug it in. And if anybody here wants to go to the swarm class and has not signed up, let's pull up the page for it so they can sign up right here online and then you'll have a, a better idea of They'll already be listed, which would be a good thing. Okay, Debbie. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just talk about one show. We are signing up for other shows, but we want to be present with this. So our, our upcoming show here is the Home and Garden Idea Fair, and it's at the um, at it's at the uh, Clark County Fairgrounds. It's three days. It's uh, April 27th through the 29th. And hours nine in the morning to six in the evening, Sunday, which is the last day, is 10 to five. So I'm going to send this around. It doesn't matter if you haven't even seen a bee in your life. I really want you to seriously consider to come dance and, and have fun with us at this fair. Um, I'm looking uh, for, and, and I'll contact you about what's available or what's comfortable for you and your schedule. Um, and some people can't come for this, this part of the day or this part of the day. They might be able to come for this middle part of the day. Great, 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 great. Come dance. So I'm going to send out two of these. I, but all I need is I need your name and telephone number and email. That's it. And create your own order on that. So there's one going around this side of the room and one going around... <laughs> this side of the room. Please participate. This is really important and you're going to learn stuff. There will be an active beekeeper at every shift. So, and, and, and if you've got smartphones, bring them because that's another way of answering people's questions and we can give you some, some sites to do that, on, including our own. Cool. No, I'm not going to. I'm going to call and contact by email, however, and I, I will, and we're gonna specifically tailor this to each one who wants to volunteer. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions before I turn it over to Jack? It's a, it's a, it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday at the end of the month, um, 27th, 28th, and 29th of April. 
about what are your neighbors going to think if you start hanging hives up in trees and all that is right now with this program is small enough and the properties we're putting them on are people that you know like really want them um it used to be that when you were going to put bees on your property a lot of cities said you had to tell all your neighbors within a certain you know area and you had to get their permission which we realized is just pretty much absurd. So that's falling off of a lot of the legality and bee laws now. So, but, um, so I, you know, I don't announce it. It's like, it's my business. If I get a dog whose barking is gonna upset my neighbors, I'm certain, or if I have kids, that are you know going to grow up and run around and scream and yell down the streets. That's going to affect my neighbors. If I get cats, we're going to go to my neighbor's yard. That's going to affect my neighbors. But I don't feel like I need to announce to all my neighbors. Now, people, if they have issues with being stung and they're severely allergic, they need to be carrying an EpiPen because your bees. Who knows what what bees might bother them? And these boxes are set in trees. They're not going to have a lot of activity anywhere down close to them at all. So this is just a real shifting time in the bee world. And um, I just think that the approach is your community and your neighbors. Some people, their neighbors will not allow them to have bees and they'll put up such a fuss and such a stink that the whole thing becomes impossible. My neighbors are all fine. It just depends on your neighbors. And it, it so it really makes sense if you're a beekeeper to, um, to know your neighbors and uh, if you collect honey at all, give them some sometime or you know, a frame of wax so they can see how awesome it is and the things that bees do and remind them that their gardens are going to be in much better shape thanks to you. You're, you're providing a service. You're not providing a dangerous creature. You're providing a necessary ecological service. And I want to see beekeeping to start looking and being cast in that light more and more. Yes. Um, one of the things about beekeeping, and you talk to people, they don't even know the difference between yellow jackets and bees. So they think they have bees in their yard when there's actually a yellow jacket nest in the ground. Bees don't nest in the ground. Well, bumblebees occasionally do, but honeybees don't. So I think one of the important things is what we're trying to do with this group, which is educating people. And that's what the Chemist Library wants to do as well. They're, they're going to educate people through a display down in the, in the hallway. They're going to be talking. They've, they are partnering with us on beekeeping and what we do. When you talk to people that are around you, your neighbors, um, you can show them the fact that unless you stand in front of the beehive, when they're exiting the beehive and coming back in, the bees are going up in the air and out. They don't go after you. People have flowers and weeds all over their yards. Bees are going to be in those flowers, native bees and honeybees. If people step on a bee, or they sit on a bee, or they slap a bee, there's a good chance they're going to get stung. But those animals are out in the wilderness, and they're out in the suburbia and in the urban environment. So people need to understand, know, be educated about, take part in, and so that they feel more comfortable and they feel less vulnerable. I was a, a classroom teacher for 21 years. In middle school and we always had to take EpiPens whenever we went on a field trip and I did a lot of them uh, because I have a forestry and a bio degree so I was taking 
people out, um, uh, kids out all the time. There are rules and regulations that you have to follow, but at the same time, people that are, are knowledgeable are less afraid and more joyous and more excited about doing this kind of work. So I think it's really important that you know who your neighbors are and know that part of doing this work is actually educating people to, to be less afraid. Um, I know this is not bees, but I just have to bring this up because I was looking at this. There's a lot of coyotes. I live. There's a lot of coyotes all around me. You see them coming out in the middle of the day. And one of the reasons why is because people are not hazing them. They think it's me, but it's actually not me. It's better for the coyotes because then they won't get shot by, you know, animal control people because they're afraid of people. But if people are educated about what wild animals do, they're less likely to exhibit behavior that's going to get them hurt. For example, when people have a, an insect lands on them, they slap it or they try to knock it off of them. If you tell kids, if you tell adults, blow on it, it will fly away. And it does. The next time one lands on them, they're not going to feel the need to slap at it. And so if they hate our breath. They don't like CO2. They just leave. <laughs> so and I've done this over and over again. And I, you know, I was a person who had to learn this too. So I think education really is the key for getting people, including your neighbors, to be less paranoid about it. Yes. So are there any cities in the Um there are there are. Um we're uh, currently this group is working on re uh revamping the code. Um Canis wants to be a, a B City USA city. Um, Puyallup and Seattle are actually B-city uh, cities, and Canvas is in the works for doing that as well. And so one of the things that has to happen is the code has to, to fit what uh, would make that possible. And so we're working on that. And Jacqueline and Susan have worked on getting wording that's going to fit um, hobby beekeepers as opposed to agricultural commodity beekeepers. So yes, there is going to be a set of regulations slash code that's going to be um, available for people to see online, et cetera. I don't know about Vancouver, and that's something that I'm looking into as well, but it's a good question. Um, I want to make a point that um, yes. I live in the city and I think keeping bees. But one thing to think about is we're creating habitat. That's really what we're doing, unless you're, um, you know, taking honey from the bees and using them as livestock, as we sometimes refer to it in preservation beekeeping, we're really creating habitat. And these are not our pets. We are in service, as I feel, a steward to the bees rather than a keeper of the bees. They're keeping me, you know, sane a lot of days because what they do for me and my garden and my neighbors. And so it really is about education, but it's just, you know, humbling ourselves to not be in charge of everything but to provide support for the things that live in our, in our world as well as us. How do you address the pesticide and herbicides and this bee ordinance? Because a lot of people use chemicals on their yard. That's true. So how are you addressing that with the ordinance? We're working on it and we're trying to find wording um, about that. And, you know, we, right now, Canvas has to take the first steps and there are no steps in it right now about pesticides and herbicides. And Jacqueline and I are working with the wording. What can we legitimately ask, you know, and, and getting that right. But it is on our minds and we are not going to let this ordinance pass without something in there really addressing the tremendous problem with the pesticides. It's important that you can't tell somebody they can't use pesticides. And the city cannot regulate that. They can't tell people what to do with their property. They can't, but they can suggest it and they can encourage it. And so what is happening with BC uh, local, locales around the country is that part of being a B city means that you are asking people not to. And whether they don't or do is really up to them. But if you educate people, 
the chances are that they, if they have an alternative or alternatives, they will take up with that. Particularly if you know most people understand that pesticides have a heavy effect on insects and anything related to them. So you know it's important that that be part of the education process. Well, part of the education. I'm I'm just relocated from New Mexico and I'm in Los Angeles. And where I lived with bees, um, pesticides, people put sign, this is a no spray area. And I think that you put enough sign, no spray, what does that mean? And that has helped a lot. Um, Part of the bee city thing is that we'll be having regular articles and columns in some local papers about these things, just keep hitting it over and over. Remember, it's spring pollinators are out, you know, we'll just keep pushing that and there'll be signage pushing that. And we'll, we're talking to the city about, you know, these are the chemicals that we would like to see you not use. And they're talking to their uh, landscape managers about that. And, and he said, they're all, the landscape managers are very careful with application of anything. Um, and they use as little as possible and, you know, not on flowers that are in bloom. And, you know, they're, they're pretty cued in. We're just hoping to cue them in more. And I don't want to, well, of course, I, I don't want to cut this short, but we need to move along. Thanks. Okay. Uh, tomorrow I'm teaching an all-day class on swarming and um, how to collect bees. Collect always sounds so weird to me, but I don't know how to say it differently yet. Um, inviting, yes, um, <laughs> yes, inviting them to come and live with me. <laughs> um, so I've been doing this for 14 years now. Um, in my best year, I caught 42 swarms. I have a lot of experience with it, and yeah, I'm, I consider myself an expert. Bill Avery here, by the way, has probably almost as much as I have. Yeah, yeah, so he was just two years behind me. Yeah, so yeah, we're probably the peers. <laughs> and there's a lot of you in the room that have done a lot of um, swarm collecting. Gary, I know, has as well, and others of you too. And I'm so glad to see that we've spread this. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. My class tomorrow goes from 10 to somewhere between 3 and 4, and it's in Ventersburg at the Ventersburg Little One Room Schoolhouse. And, um, and it's an all-day class. So this is just going to be a little bit piece of it because I want you all to know this about bait hives. So the class is all the rest of the stuff around why do bees swarm and how different ways to collect, many different ways and kinds of um, methods you can use to collect them and um, bait boxes and doing cutouts and just pretty much everything about when bees swarm, what happens and what can you do. So I'm going to show you a sample of a bait box that I use. Um, I, I made these. I made these the collective way that a wife talks. <laughs> we actually made this. We came up with this idea, and then my husband made this. And um, this one has been sitting outside. I didn't bring it in this winter. It's the first time I ever left one of mine out, and I just went and got it off the tree this week. And you can see that the plywood is all warped, and I have to replace it like immediately because the swarm season starts this coming week. I haven't heard anybody getting a swarm yet in the area, but it, it, especially with this kind of weather, we will have swarms coming any day. So what I've got in here is this is a swarm box made specifically for a top bar hive that I have. And that top bar hive is this particular shape right here. And these... Um, these bars exactly fit it. They're out of that hive. And so what I did was, first of all, I should probably tell you, first of all, I just went and collected swarms everywhere. And that was how I did it. It was years later, it was probably 10 years later that I went, bait boxes, what a great idea. So this goes out and collects the swarm for me. I just come by and pick it up. And it's way, way, way simpler. <laughs> yes. I mean, it, it's easy, and I can even do it on a schedule, which you can never do with a swarm. When the swarms come, um, I have some of these up. Uh, this particular one caught a swarm uh, last year or the year before. I remember I took it down, and I walked over, and I 
shook these off. I didn't shook them off. I just lifted them in, moved a whole swarm into it, and then said, what the heck? I'll put this thing back up. The next day, it had another swarm in it. It's like, yeah, woo. That's fast. And once bees pick one, they it smells like bees. So they're likely to pick it again and again. So this, this one has come out of my very favorite, easiest site. So first of all, I'll just show you what, what's in here. So these are bars that come from my other hive. And in the inside, let me take this out. You can see it's just old comb. I just grabbed a few from it. And this is what it looks like on the inside. Pretty much just like you imagined. <laughs> and it's got one little hole, two little holes right down here. And these are holes that are about the size of like a quarter. Um, if you make it a little bit bigger hole, you actually have to like put a nail through the center of it because little birds will want to come in and nest in it. It's a great place for little birds. Yeah, so you, you want you do not want, especially you're gonna not monitor this every day. So you want it to be somewhere where you don't get a surprise like squirrels or squirrels. <laughs> and then all I do is I um I bought a bottle of lemongrass oil, pure organic lemongrass oil, like 10 years ago. And I think I've used up about a quarter <laughs> of this little vial because you do not use a lot of it. What I do is I take a toothpick and I stick it in there. And by the way, I can't find it this year. Did I loan it to anybody? You know, some of us. Oh, good. I, yes, I need some, and I and like you'll buy one, and it'll last you a lifetime unless you misplace it, like I did. Okay, so what I do is I take my little bottle of it's just a little bottle of lemongrass oil. I stick a toothpick into it, just touch it to a toothpick, and then I touch it to this, and like you would hardly be able to smell that. But a bee has different scents, and that bee. So and then what's that? Oh, cotton. It's a cotton pad. Thank you. I didn't even think to tell you that. So I put the little dot of lemongrass oil on this cotton pad, and then I stick it in a baggie, and then I seal the baggie. <laughs> to So I've only got about like maybe a third of it open, and then I put it in there. Believe it or not, that is plenty to attract bees. It's, it's the complete opposite. And the first year I did it, I was like, oh, that can't be enough. And I put like three drops of lemongrass oil and no bee would go near it. It's like, you know, the guy with too much aftershave. <laughs> yeah. So I stick that in the bottom and then I fill in the rest of it with my bars. I like to use bars that I've used before because they've got the propolis on them and the propolis has a scent too. And then um, this one, this is one that came out of I'm going to make a mess here. This is actually just old comb, but this isn't really what I want to have in there for them to build nice fresh comb out of. So all I'll do is just break this off like that and leave a little bit. And really, I'm talking like a little bit. That's even more than I need. Just enough there to give them a little bit of a start. And again, I love the smell of it. Um, if you have any... One thing to know is if you now see how this is like right down the bar, exactly right. And this one is pretty good, but you can see right here when the propolis that they were going to start to walk this one off this way. And I don't want that to happen. So what I'll do is take a hive tool, that little scraper thing, and I'll scrape this off so it doesn't have any direction going that way. That will save you a lot of effort later. So I'll just put like maybe one, two, or three of them that have a little bit of comb. Here's my other one. And again, I don't need all of that. I'll just take that one off. Is, um, what's the one that is the wax enough uh, yep. to attract them, or do you prefer to have um, lemongrass too? Well, I have, see, this already has propolis on it, mm -hmm. so I'm covered with that. And Susan, did you make a spray up of some of the propolis? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and if you put the scent, the scent of propolis in there, so we, if you don't have what I have, with, I always have propolis around, um, then you can spray it and that will do it. Yeah. You don't need that much. You just need, if you're gonna catch it, if you're gonna use it to catch a swarm, 
You can. Yeah. Yeah, and and the cool thing is, you can just yesterday I set up a warre hive that I have. That's one of the smaller vertical hives. It's kind of like a, a tree trunk, but in um, hive function. And I just set one up yesterday because it's empty. And what the heck? I might as well leave it. You know, and it's got it's got some old comb, or in your case, it, you could put yeah, if you put a bar like this in there or you got some of the propolis spray or something, or even just take home a piece of this and stick it in there. So everybody can go home with some. Yeah, and just put that in there. It smells like bee. That's the only thing you wanna you know, have is it smells like bee, and the bees will come and check it out. For, for people who are new to this, uh, they might be interested in understanding what propolis is about. Oh, propolis, thank you. Always stop me if I get like 14 years in, and sometimes I forget the most basic things. Um, propolis is this, this is the wax right here that they build the comb on. But out here, this red stuff here, let's pass that around. That red stuff that's on the edge. This is, yeah, this is a year old and it's still super fragrant. This red stuff is the bee glue. And you can see they run a little a seam right down here because they're going to glue these two together because that's what bees do. They want to make it nice and secure and stable. Uh, but it's also super fragrant, so they smell it. And bees don't actually have an immune system. However, they make the propolis for two reasons. One of them is because it acts as a glue. And the second is because the propolis actually is their immune system. They breathe their immune system. So we have an immune system inside of us. Bees have an external one, which is made up of the propolis. It's made up of essential oils, um, the sap from like pine trees and spruce trees, um, and a little a little teeny bit of pollen. And what else is one fourth, fourth ingredient? Anybody remember what it is? Magic. <laughs> and they make this up and they start making it actually in January as soon as as soon as the sap starts running in the in the winter trees in the evergreens so and then they come home and they put it together and they use it as glue and it's all around them and ideally if you are going to be raising your bees the way that I do and a lot of us here do we're very very low intervention um, that means that I hardly ever open up my hives they're healthy, they rock along, they do a great job. And one of the advantages is because we don't open the hives, that, that air in there that's infused with all of this propolis, it doesn't get you know, dissipated. So the more you leave your hives closed up, the more chance there are for the bees to just be living like feral bees live, like wild bees live, living in that immune system that's part of it. And that helps keep them healthy, pretty cool. Okay, so then I've got all of my bars all the way across. I didn't bring all of them, but you get the picture. And then this is just a little top that's fit like that. And it fits down over the edge so it doesn't get rain into this part. Um, plywood, normally you would never build with plywood when you have bees because the hives are exposed to a lot of moisture. But in this case, where I'm gonna put it up in April and take it down in June, um, unless I forget, <laughs> you can see that um, that would be just fine for two months. Plywood would be just fine. And it's not on the interior either. This is made, of, made with pine. Uh, it doesn't have any glues in it. And that's the reason we often don't use plywood because it has glues that um, give off the off gas. Okay, so now I've got this here. And then I've got a hole drilled into this. That's the back of it. And there's a hole drilled in up here. And what you do is you come over to your local tree and you want to be about, well, ideal is 15 to 25 feet, yeah. but I don't have a fire department ladder. <laughs> so mine are all as tall as my step ladder, um, which is about this high, and then add five feet onto that. Um, and so what we do is uh, we'll climb up there and you get a a good honking big nail, like really, like one that's that long and thick, and you put it in at an angle. 
when you put it in an angle, that way when the wind blows it around, it's not going to fall off and tilt the nail down or anything. So you want to do that. Um, latest research, make it a copper nail. It's less damaging to the tree. Oh, cool. I didn't research. know that. And punch, I just punch you around here. Or if I get a piece of it, I'll put this on a branch. Mm -hmm. um, I'll cut a branch and I'll put this through it and then I'll bungee you mine. Mine have another, the book extends off the bottom, so I can bungee at the bottom. That's a great idea. Easy. I never thought of doing that. Yeah. Um, one of the other things is if you make one of these yourself, that you always want to use screws rather than nails because it will get bumped around in the wind and the nails will just fall apart and the screws will hold it together. So I put it up about, however, mine are probably 12 feet high. And there's some good locations. What bees really like is to be on the edge of stuff. So I have pastures for our cows that are like this and then all of a sudden I have a forest. They want to be right along the edge of that forest. And if you think of it from a bee's point of view, too, they come out, and like Thea said, you know, they fly up, and they immediately get an overview of everything that's out here. They don't put them down low. If you put them, you know, at floor level, um, bumblebees will probably find them and be totally happy about that. But bees are arboreal. That means they like to be up high in the trees. So the higher you can get it, the better. Um, yeah, streams and creeks, um, sources of water that are fairly nearby. They like to be near that too. Uh, but you don't even have to get real fancy with it. I put this on the second floor balcony, second floor deck that we've got, and I've caught bees up there too. So they just like to be up as high as you can. Um, other people have just put them off like the eve of their roof in the garage. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a tree out in the woods. So take... I mean, take a chance and see. I usually put up about, in our, on our land, I usually put up about four of these a year, and they're quite productive. So, and then I have some other ones that I have put out. I have a friend who, um, well, I hardly know her, actually. I only know her because she called me once with a swarm, and I looked at her location. She lives in a really nice house along this kind of a, a, a dip that goes down in front of her and then there's forest and marshland on the other side and bees love to be around marshland because there's so much flower so it's a good location for them so I offered to her to off of her second floor balcony which is a, a whole house length long to just stick a nail in and hang one of these up there and that's worked out really well so if you find somebody with a really good location like that just ask them most people hi can I take away your bees Probably most people are pretty happy about that. Um, uh, oh, ask me questions. Um, yes, I, thank you. Because I really believe that it's better if you have everything spread out anyway. I have 10 acres, so I can spread my bees out. And whereas my bees all used to be in a little gazebo about as big as these tables here, now I have them spread out. So that they're, I think all my hives are at least 100 feet apart. And bees like to go look. Now, if you have a hive right here that's an existing hive, and you know they're going to swarm this spring, don't put this right here next to it. This is like the teenage boy who goes off on his own, and he does not want to live next to mom. <laughs> so let this be somewhere where there's an adventure associated with it. <laughs> um, all right, so now let's, oh, you had a question. <laughs> okay. Um, they come in through these little holes, and if you go take a look, it's really fun because you'll see scout bees coming to check it out. Scout bees will be coming along and looking and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I found someplace. And they'll go back and they'll do a little dance. They'll do a little figure eight dance, the waggle dance, and they'll let everybody know that I found a location, and they'll bring more scouts back and more scouts back. And they all check it out. They send the picture back to the hive. This is a cool place. When we're ready to swarm, we're, we've already got a place picked. You sometimes will even see, and I have seen this a few times now, where some of the scout bees are inside and they're coming out and they're looking around. And then some other hives, bees, scout bees come over to check it out too. And you'll actually get a little battle on the front doorstep. No, this is mine. <laughs> I was here first. Yeah. So they'll lay claim to it even before the swarm is happening. And they'll chase everybody else away. 
So once it's full, and then I can tell, you know, you have to kind of, oh, what's your question? I have actually just left my bees at ground level. They don't have to be high up. I've had four colonies ground level and they get full of honey. And did they adopt that new hive? Yeah. Yeah. gazebo to get an, get an empty hive, whoop, and there's a swarm in it. You know, and I wasn't set up for it. I didn't think of that as as being a bait hive. It was just a hive I hadn't gotten around to cleaning up yet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then you come, now a difference, what you're going to see when you first see scout bees is they'll be sporadic going in and out, but there can be quite a few bees. You could still have 50 bees around the corner. You know, and just all out here checking it out, looking in. That's usually just before they adopt it. Keep checking it every day, and there'll be one day where now you have a whole bunch of bees in it. Um, it's good to know that the bees are all in there before you get your get all of this taken apart and taken down. The way you, I don't know, I don't know how to tell you how to tell that because you just have a sense when they're there. The, the activity looks different. Instead of kind of coming out and moving around and doing this, they come out and they're on a mission. You know, the foragers are coming out. So you'll see a lot more of the out and back rather than you see, hey, this is a cool house. We should come see that. Okay. Yeah? I was watching them for coming in with um, pollen on their legs. There's, okay, it's time to change it out. I go back in the evening and get it and put up a blank one. So between the straight back and forth and the pollen on their legs, you've got bees. you got bees. And then you're going to take it down. Um, this is the huge advantage of bait hives. First of all, I can see my dad was visiting two summers ago, and we were just busy, and I saw that this hive got populated, and I knew I wasn't going to get to it for a few days, and it didn't make any difference. You know, whereas a swarm hanging on a tree branch, you're going to drop what you're doing right now and go capture that, that swarm. So I took this down and I took it up to where my empty hive was. And there's no taking the box and shaking it in or doing anything like that. All I did was pick up this comb and this bar. And they were already building comb on it and just put it <laughs> into the hive. That's it. And I always keep them in the exact same order that I take them out, but that's it. You just did the whole transition. I mean, you don't, this is something where you don't even have to wear a bee suit if you don't want to, because it's, it's so easy. And all I do is I leave this, once I've got all the bars in the real, the real hive, I just leave this box open and there'll still be bees buzzing around in it, but they're gonna, they're gonna know that mom's over here and they just all move in over the next, by the time you're in dust, there's nothing left in this. And that's it. You did your whole move. Um, you see it's Yeah. One time I had a bunch, I moved these guys up and I moved them at dusk, but some of the bees were still, the, the forages were still coming back after dusk. And the other thing is that this is in my bee yard. So I was moving them about 100 feet away to the permanent hive. And when, when I came to, back to check that night, there were about, <coughs> probably about 300 bees, three, 400 bees still in it. That had just come back at dusk. That was a big foraging mission. And so I scooped them all up. I put them in a little plastic container and walked them up and let them all go and they went inside. The next night there were 100 bees in here and the next night there were 10 bees in here. So they had remembered when we go out, we come back to here and we had to kind of repattern that. So. And that, that really only happens if you're doing it in your locale. If I'm putting this up and it's two miles away, when I move those bees, 
they're in a foreign area and they have to reacclimate and they'll do that. If it's just a hundred feet away, some of them may remember that the terrain looks the same and I go here. So just keep that in mind, check for scouts so you don't lose any. Um, anything else? If you want to register for the swarm class, um, go to spiritbee.com and there's two registrations on it. One is if you're not a bee club member, it's 50 bucks. And if you're a preservation beekeeping club member, then it's 45 bucks. So, and I got room. Oh, and you can just write me a check, yeah, okay. or, or hand me cash and show up tomorrow morning. Okay. Just give me your email address so I can give you drive, uh, I'll email you driving directions this afternoon. Oh, good. Okay. Anyone else got any other questions? Okay. Um, so, we're going to move into the activity that we have planned, which is... Uh, I made this up. You can probably tell. <laughs> I was somewhere and I saw this. Actually, Amber Ham gave me this basket. She saw it somewhere at a store and said that I was always interested in stuff like this. She knew I'd find some use for, for bees. What I noticed was when my when my established hives come out, the first thing they do is they usually go to the closest nearby tree and they hang on the tree for a while. That's usually a very short time that they hang around, it's like, like under an hour, sometimes 20 minutes. And for the umpteenth time, I was getting a, a swarm of bees out of a gumi bush. My gumi bush is dense, and they were on, they were in it, the hive was in it. So the hive shape, the swarm shape looked kind of like this, but the gumi bush is like this, and it was dense, so they were on every single branch. There was everything in there, it took me forever to get them off. And no sooner had I done that than two days later, they went into the same place again. So I had to do it with two different hives, two different swarms. So I got this idea that what they were looking for was something really close by to hang off of. So I made this. I had my husband cut me a, actually I think we had this piece already cut somewhere in the shed. I put this basket on and I put a post underneath this because they're looking for something to hang off of. And then what I did was set up a tripod with some 10 foot long poles and I have a hook on the top of it and I hung it like this and bees landed on it. It was, so, it was like total success. And what I did was I made some of that um, propolis stuff and I, I, I heated it up and I swabbed it on with a paintbrush so that it had like a bees have been here before thing. So. I invented this. But it's like my one invention and I'm really proud of it. Okay. And um and the last part of it is that I got this basket at um New Seasons the other night and it has a top on it. But I was just looking at like what a great thing to move swarms in. And I could even, if I wanted to use this, um, lift that basket up to it and do that and then just walk away. So, that's a gorgeous okay. basket. Awesome. So we have um, we have an activity that we, we promised um, for making bait boxes and anybody that's interested in Having one, we purchased these uh, with membership money and also donated money. And so uh, we are asking that anybody who wants one needs to donate $10 so we can replenish with that. So um, Susan, how would you like people to um, to do that? Okay. Um, bring our checks and funds to fix it. There. Delegating, right? Um, so, Dean Lesby, who's a famous beekeeper in New Mexico, makes these for bait hives and hangs them all over her apiary, and that's where I saw this. Um, yes, oh, just the next five minutes, and then I'll be done. So, what I brought today 
is. I'm going to show this because we actually have people watching from other states wanting to do the bait hive thing. So, and you can make more than one. You just have to pay for it. Can I ask you a quick question? What? Um, I don't have any set for these on my property right now. I if I make one of these and bring it home and I'm lucky enough to get a swarm, I can probably like find someone else to take it or babysit. How long does it take to get it? It can take a day. I mean, just contact one of us, just, you know, get a hold of us. And, and uh, essentially, we've got like a swarm list and swarm phone numbers to call. Just get on the right. Here, I've got a card for you. In that container, it'll stay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, many people will be happy to take it off your hands. And this year, what we're doing is we're charging $80 for people who have swarms to pass on to other pe people. So if you want to sell your, collect them and sell them, that's good because we're trying to, um, to make the whole swarm program a bit monetized. So the person, Debbie, who answers the phone can get paid. The people who are taking their cars out, picking up the swarm can get paid. And it's still half the price of what anything's running if you buy a package. So here we are. I think that it will just pull it in. Don't leave it out all in the winter. The propolis is almost forever. And what I would do in the spring is I clip the zip ties, open it up, put in some fresh wax or something. And um, with the lemongrass oil, uh, you can also just do something called um, the Swarm Commander. You can buy it on Amazon and just give a little spritz inside the hive. Because even um, the lemongrass oil, they say about every two weeks you, you need to put another dot on because the smells wear out. Um, let's see. I did bring my lemongrass oil. <laughs> And then grass royal. Um, oh, Jacqueline, I brought your potato masher. In the past, um, swarm, swarm call. Um, I'll be answering one. Um, also, who wants to go around and get these cards out to a police department? Yes, sir. Yes, so take them, and even if you don't have them to pass out, take one, put it on your fridge. That's the swarm line number. So you're going to want to keep that. Okay, now, the logistics of this might be a little confounding, but um, we've got some time, and we don't have to be out of here until, like, 2, so um, here's my propolis water to spray onto them on the inside. So, all I'm going to do, heads up, everybody, this is pretty darn simple. Construction, even I can do. I'm going to put these two together. I brought ice picks and little pokey things, but any of you who have knives might want to use those and just make about four holes around the side. And then, where did I put all the zip ties? And then Jennifer brought us zip ties. We're just going to zip tie the puppy shut. And these holes, you will go home and in some creative way fill. Uh, and you can either use the bottom for them to come in on, or you can cut a little hole and then block up your bottoms. But that's all there is to it. And it's very lightweight. You can hang it anywhere. You can strap it up in a tree. So what you're going to do is take these, drill your little holes, and then come up and get the spray. And... Um, You know, I uh, came up with this last year. I'm so proud of myself. Um, I made wax 
And um, when the wax is done, the way I make wax is uh, I, I just put it in a big vat of, with, with this much water on the bottom. And, and then I let it cool. And then I lift the wax out and that water underneath looks like this. So it's like, I'm gonna use this. So it works really, really well. So just to spritz the inside of it enough to get some, some good scent. No, this is just, just water. Um, the, the tincture is just too darn expensive to use. It, you know, I've got, I made like a gallon of tincture a few years ago and I was spraying the inside of my skeps with it. And it's like, this is running out real quick. So now I just squirt them with this. So squirt this in. We'll use the zip ties to close it. And this is an entire bag of old crappy moldy comb. So come in, grab some comb pieces, consider your neighbor, just, you know, take a piece or so, and if we have extras and we'll pass them all out. Put that in the bottom, it will be nice and stinky. You can take a little dab of this on your, and just touch the inside of the hive and you're done, okay? So lemongrass oil, propolis water to refill this if it runs out, uh, an assortment of wicked pokey things. Don't lose my pokey things. <laughs> what? Oh, Mary. <laughs> Your little drainage hole. No, I'm going to plug them all probably when I get home, and I'm going to make another entrance. Probably for me, that's how I like it. But you know, if anybody wants, it's fine. I'm going to put it up in a tree, and I'm probably going to strap it. I'm probably just going to take straps or bungees and strap it into, you know, areas. And I have been in my yard having my bees there for six years, so I kind of know where they go when they swarm. So I know which neighbors. It's like I'm gonna have one hanging in each neighbor's yard in, in the place where they typically land. And my neighbors will be delighted. I'll give them my phone number. They'll call me when the swarm shows up. Yes? Exactly. Exactly. This is just like this, you know, don't get all wiggy about this. This is kind of like kids, like kids playing. I'm going to put a fort up into the tree. You know, I mean, you don't, it just needs to go up. And some people, you could probably, if, if you're a clever building type guy and you've got some good stout wire, you could probably make hangers, right? holes and make and hang it. Or if any of you have those old, uh, what's really good are those old weird macrame plant hangers. They're the best. Like, you know, go to go to Walmart and pick up about four or five of them and just that's what I think how I'm going to hang mine. Simple. It's, you know, it's all supported and it'll, yeah, just unhook it and there you go. These aren't needing it. That's, you know, they say that they'll last over a good year with plants in them being watered. So, and the thing with this though, as opposed to Jacqueline's bait hive is, she can leave bees in there for weeks. The only problem is when she moves them, they're gonna think that's home. You don't wanna leave bees for weeks in here. You wanna get them out fast because they're gonna build and then you're gonna lose all that comb. So I would say have these somewhere where either you or someone else is checking on them every day. No, no, because you just, they'll build whatever which way and, and to remove that new wax that's bone white and as soft as talcum powder you don't want to be fussing and lifting them out. You know, what Dee Lesby does is she has all Langstroth's. So she lets these guys go for days. And when she opens them, there's a bunch of comb in them and she slices it out and she um, sets them all up in the Lang frames with rubber bands. 
But if you don't have a lang and don't have open frames like that, trying to do anything with that wax is ridiculous. So grab them quick. Yeah. So if you are a person who doesn't have any cookies in your yard and the bees show up and you don't have a box yet, what you can always buy one, uh, or you can, uh, if you're afraid to get them, you don't know how to collect the, the swarms, call us, call the number on the card, right. and we will come get them. And we'll put them in a box for you if you want them. If you don't want them, you just want to put them up there because it, the box is because it's cool, then we'll collect them and we'll distribute them. It will find homes. Yes, I've got a bunch of old lag equipment too, so I'm in Clark County between La Centra and Woodland. So it might be very far for, I know that Portland people don't go, don't travel. Yeah, a question here. Um, I, I wouldn't have thought of this until Jacqueline mentioned something earlier, but what is the likelihood of ending up with something else moving into this? Just about nothing. Okay. I mean, if you're checking them often, basically the only thing that my experience of what moves into Bay Hives, if, if it's got like a small entrance, sometimes what you'll have is a little umbrella wasp will go in there and hang her little tiny nest up at the top. And the bees don't even care. They'll, they'll move in on her anyhow. If you leave them off, what you will get, if you get up the next year, if you will get woodpeckers, and once they can move down a little bigger, and I did have a woodpecker on one of my tree hives in the front yard, um, poking a, a, a wider hole in there, and I had to go step it up to keep them out of there. It's like, no, I got bees in there. Why are you taking? <laughs> so yes. Yeah. So so you lower this whole whole thing down, and basically what you're going to have, the bees are all going to be in the top because they all come together and they'll start up there. So you'll clip your zip zip ties, your four zip ties, and then you'll very, very gently separate out what you've got. And you'll take a peek in and go, hot bees. And um, you can unload them one of two ways. You can open the top of your hive and you can just aim them down and gently shake and gently tap, just give a little <laughs> like that, and they'll tumble out like water. Um, the way that I put most of them in my hives is I put the hive on a step so that part of the hive is off the edge of the step, and then I put a little piece of wood plank that goes up the step, and I put a sheet over the whole thing, and I would take this and shake them down on the ground, on the sheet. And then they would, essentially, here's my hive with the ramp, they, they will go up. And especially if you just move some, like with a handful, just ease them up a little bit, they'll just all walk right in. And it's a great way to see, you, you can see the queen, you can see how many drones you've got, you get to watch the whole group move in. And for me, whenever I've done that, I've never had a hive abscond. It's like, because they've chosen it. They've walked up and they've made their commitment to it. I've never had one leave. Um, the only I've had two hives absconded, and in both cases it was me shaking them into the hive and then deciding after a week they just didn't want to be there. So because they've chosen at home, they're still if you get them within a day or two, they're fine. Once they've really started seriously building comb, then you would suit up and treat them like a cutout because that's what they are, then they'll start to want to defend this. And in my yard also, um, when I've gathered swarms and you know put them into hives in my yard, I haven't had the experience of the bees going back to the bait hive or to where the swarm site was. They, when they're in that swarm mode, which is about three days, um, you know, they're kind of trance-like and you can move them around and do things with them that you really can't do after they've been established for six days or a week.
Um, actually, it can be very confusing. Uh, for instance, Jacqueline, uh, she's got this gorgeous um, uh, tree hive, a log hive, and uh, the, the hive that was in it had perished and it was empty. And then I was over at her house and she said, oh, look, you know, swarms already moved back, back in. And I'm watching bees come in, bees go in. And, and it's like, oh, yeah, you know, looks like they moved back in. And I walk to my car and I hear, because I saw the swarm. And I look up and from her wall on the other side of her house, they came right out of the wall, over the roof, into that log hive. So that was scout activity. Now, Thomas Seeley says that there are about four to 500 scouts looking for places to be. So if they, if there's, you know, if, if, if this is becoming kind of everybody's sort of top choice, you can have four and 500 bees coming in and out of here. Plus, if other hives are checking it out, you can have even more. So what I do is, when I, if I'm really suspicious that there's somebody home there, I will go up and lower it. So, you know, don't put these in precarious situations where it's really hard to get to. And put your ear up to it. I mean, you'll hear them in there if you've got a swarm. So um, that's how you would tell. So just unzip tie it, take off the box, shake it in or let them walk in, and you've got bees. So uh, I would say uh, Pixie's collecting funds. And she'll beat you up if you try to get out the door with it. <laughs> and grab two of those suckers and come on up. And If anybody wants to see what, if you're not sure what a swarm looks like, I will show you a picture of them right now.